I want to thank the panelists and get the discussion going. Uh, you've heard comments on empowerment, on the nature of the conversation, on the <coughs> lack uh, of quality measures about, uh, uh, about uh, attempts to educate physicians and to, to provide more caring and not just attempts at curing, which are sometimes futile. You've heard about successful and sometimes less successful efforts to educate the public and change behavior. Uh, even in the most challenging target groups. And I love Bill's comment about uh, empathy trumps culture. So I'd like to get the conversation going by turning the mic over to uh, uh, Dr. Pincus uh, to get us going. Well, thank you. I'm going to make a few comments. I don't have anything prepared. But I know a lot of you are curious about what's going on in the IOM. And I'm here representing, in some sense, the IOM. And let me just tell you. The Institute of Medicine has a committee um, that is looking at end-of-life issues, and it's called the Committee on Approaching Death, Addressing Key Issues at the End of Life. <coughs> and unfortunately, I can't tell you anything about it, <laughs> other than what's already in the public domain. Even people here who are on the committee, it's all embargoed. I have been told, I can tell you, that there will be some interesting and I think very forward-looking recommendations coming. The committee is hard, of, hard at work. I think you can expect that it will make a difference. And that's really what being on the committee is. That's really what all of us want to have done. So uh, we are anticipating that we will have our final meeting at, at the end of February. Then there will be some additional time till the recommendations and report are vetted and released. I would look for it hopefully sometime in the summer, and uh, hopefully it will address some of the issues that have been raised today. So I also want to make a few comments on things I heard and things I think maybe we didn't hear. And an overall theme today that <coughs> Judy mentioned and I've been sort of picking up from looking at the media is a big goal, the overriding goal, is to create trust with the public. We can put all the policies in place. We can design the reimbursement. We can do this, we can do that. But if the public don't trust the medical professionals, clinicians of all kinds, nothing is really going to change. And that, to me, is what has been so disturbing about the cases in the media that we've seen recently, is they send the message that uh, the system and the physicians, the healthcare system, don't, is not trustworthy. I also want to make a couple of comments about things that I've seen that we haven't talked about today any, in any detail, things that as a physician, we need to be attentive to. And when I'm doing clinical medicine, which I do much less often now, I always say, put myself in the patient position. What would they want? What do they need to know? And one thing we haven't talked about that I think is very important is DNR orders. Everybody thinks they know what DNR orders mean. Do not resuscitate. <coughs> But physicians, clinicians have a different perception of what they mean and how they get interpreted in hospitals. Those, the words DNR order, have entered the public language. Families think they know, but they're not aware of all the complexities. And even physicians aren't. Um, and what I mean is, oftentimes these are used as justification for not providing treatment. Oftentimes, none of us realize that if you sign the DNR in the, in the hospital, if you have it on your refrigerator door, like my mother who died last year with bad dementia, there it was, bright pink on the refrigerator door. But it wasn't really until relatively recently that I fully appreciated that what's in a hospital doesn't go home. Families don't know it. It's a physician order to the EMT, and we need to educate the public about that 
And I think key to educating is changing our language. Allow natural death. Do something that people want. Don't say, don't do it, withhold treatment. Let life, in, uh, in accordance with your beliefs, end in a way that is natural and accepted, and as Judy says, normalize death. The other thing I want to mention is something that is coming out in some states now, which is PULSED, and it was mentioned briefly, Physician Order of Life-Sustaining Treatment. And this, again, is entering, starting to enter, especially in the Northwest, and in Oregon, the vernacular. And this, this needs to be uh, conveyed to the public in that it's something they do with their doctor. It's a physician order, and it's something that sets what you want so that when the EMTs come, Everything's been decided. The physician has written orders, so that's ahead of time. So those are things that, are, that I think from a patient perspective, people deal with, need to know about. So my, so my message today is really in terms of beside the IOM is we have a job to do, and the biggest job is convincing the general public of all, from all backgrounds that we're trustworthy and we're working in their best interests. And so as we think about policy, think about how to build trust and how to build acceptance and how to build engagement so people can die well, which is what all families want. Thank you. We invite you to come up to uh, the mic and we can use one to pass around also. Yes, hi, I'm Joanne Roberts. I'm from that place out far in the Northwest where Pulse is part of the vernacular, and so is Death with Dignity. And I appreciate that you mentioned that in some ways we're being led now by the consumers. I think that's true. What I didn't hear about uh, was execution on advanced care planning. Lots of discussion about how we're going to get it done. Face the audience, okay. <laughs> So what I didn't hear about was execution of advanced care planning and how in this fragmented system we assure that those wishes that get started with the patient and family really get carried out in the first step, the second step, the third step of the health care system. Well, I think you've raised a, a really key point. Uh, I remember I finished my comments by saying that time is now, and uh, I, I think it's spot on. That is, the execution piece is what we really need. Part of what I was trying to convey about physicians is they're more ready than we give them credit for, is my, was my read. I would never have guessed the kinds of numbers that the Cambia Foundation found in terms of support for these things. Uh, they don't necessarily know how to do it. They admit that. That's part of what the data showed. Uh, and our, our responsibility is to provide examples to them, to implement at sites, and actually execute exactly what you're getting to, where it goes through the system. And it raises the second point that these, this has to be thought of as a system approach, not as an individual practitioner approach. We need the individual practitioners, but it's got to go through the health systems, and by that I'm thinking of the local health systems, uh, uh, the hospital, the community physicians, the transitions of care, uh, the uh, extended care facilities, et cetera. Without linking those together as a system, uh, we're going to have the, just another example of fragmentation again, and we know the results of that have been completely ineffective. Um, just briefly, because I was talking about uh, there are lots of fail-safes that could be built into the system that some are there and we don't use them. We have some um, physician quality reporting measures about advanced care planning that are in the books. We have advanced care planning and the Welcome to Medicare um, initial appointment that's on the books. I know it can be very dismissive to say, well, none of that's working, but we have some of these tools out there. The idea is to develop a glide path where 
advanced care planning is the norm and is part of an initial care planning effort that a person is making and that the decisions and the work that they're doing are in the times that they need it. But the system itself has to have some pieces built into it. Uh, just very quickly, I mean, Pulse was mentioned. That's one attempt to create a, a system that makes doing the right thing uh, routine, uh, easier, and um, uh, part of uh, ultimately part of the payment system. But but even with with changing systems, you still have to change uh, the hearts and minds of the providers because with Pulse as well as with advanced care planning, uh, the, the 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 quality of the discussion is both the beating heart of Pulse and also its Achilles heel when it's not done right. I, would, I think we're at a point where um, there's the possibility of a major growth in how we perceive advanced care planning. And I was quite struck that Charlie started us off with a rather grand, uh, and, and I think <coughs> at least in hearing it quickly, uh, correct view of uh, comprehensive care planning. That what we really need is a good care plan for very complicated patients. And advanced care, I mean, it's always in advance. Um, and advanced care planning is sort of the chunk of a good care plan that deals with effectively emergency or terribly urgent interventions uh, when a person is you know, teetering on the brink. And, and, you know, the POST has a real role as a separate document, and maybe other documents do. But do we think of advanced care planning as part of comprehensive care planning? Or do we think of advanced care planning as something separate and keep our literature separate, keep who writes about it separate, keep, uh, you know, I mean, that's lawyers and ethicists who write about it. Comprehensive care planning is, you know, social workers and, and gerontologists. Um, do we keep our funding separate? You know, Mark Warner's bill really calls for comprehensive care planning. And yes, advanced care planning is in there and POLST is in there as part. But I think we're really at, a, at an important divide. And it was quite striking that Charlie started you, this panel off with the, with the broader vision. And then everybody spoke to the very narrow advanced care planning that we thought was terribly important to rescue people from the clutches of medical care in 1970. You know, am I missing something here? Or is it time that we grow a broader vision? Joanne, before you sit down. Would all speakers say your name, although everybody in this room knows who you are. <laughs> it's the poster at the post office that gives it away. Um, I'm Joanne Lynn. At, uh, I'm the director of the Center for Elder Care and Advanced Illness at Altarum Institute. Thank you, Joanne. So, so Joanne, you're, you're making the point, if I'm correct, that by dichotomizing advanced care planning away from the, the core functions of care planning, we're actually creating a barrier to incorporating it. We're, we're continuing the, we're continuing its roots, which were in a, a revulsion against the dominance and domineeringness of medical care in the 60s and early 70s, where we needed a way for people to say, I'm not going the usual path, I'm stepping out and doing something different. And it was seen as kind of avant-garde, but it was a civil rights claim. And now, I mean, there is a civil rights claim in there and, and very much in, in your definition where priorities and an individualized and person-centered care plan that goes across settings and so forth. But it's a more recognition that people are in very difficult circumstances and are fragile in a number of directions. And we need a comprehensive care plan that deals with housing and getting food in and, uh, and how the person's gonna get clean and fed. Um, along with, you know, whether they want a resuscitation or to go to the hospital again. And that, that the, what we've thought of as an advanced care plan is a category within a care plan, or whether we think of a care plan as something that happens when those social workers get a hold of our patients, and advanced care plans are something that happens when the palliative care folks get a hold of our patients. And never the two shall meet. They're, they're traveling different pathways. And I obviously prefer your definition as you started off. But I think there's a lot of tradition that keeps us bound up in you know, the origins of advanced care planning, which was you know, an anti-medical dominance uh, endeavor and a civil rights claim. It was an autonomy claim, not an affirmation of a, of a way of planning. Um, 
perhaps I can just try and respond briefly to that. Um, I think that the conceptualization of advanced care planning um, has uh, evolved uh, quite a bit uh, away from things that are focusing upon palliative care and things at the very end of life to a plan for care throughout a, a serious illness. Um, and uh, in that way, uh, I think that we, it is being broadened out considerably. Responses? I think Laura has said everything. I'm Laura Hansen. I'm a geriatrician and palliative medicine physician working at the University of North Carolina. And um, I wanted to both um, acknowledge David Longnecker's comment about workforce, but also challenge it. Um, and I really wanted to encourage us to be thinking about uh, advanced care planning, shared decision making, and goals of care as a continued effort across the lifespan, which is really consistent with the titling of this conference itself, and to recognize that we actually do have a workforce problem, um, to recognize that I am one of only 4,400 board certified palliative medicine physicians in the United States of America. And most of us do this work not as a full-time job, but as part of other jobs, often in geriatrics and in primary care, which are other shortage areas. Um, nurses have caught on to this faster, and we have over 10,000 certified nurses in hospice and palliative medicine, but that cannot possibly be the workforce that we need in the specialty area. Um, for the responsibility that we know exists. I want to encourage us to think, though, when we talk about advanced care planning and shared decision making, that just like congestive heart failure, it's not a job purely for specialists, and that was David's point. Um, most of congestive heart failure is taken care of by family medicine providers, people who are generalists. Um, but there's a role for specialty care as well. And in advanced care planning and shared decision making, there's a conversation that begins often in home and family. And I think we can extend and promote that conversation through faith communities, through um, sharing of communication tools, like some of the tools that have been mentioned here today, that really empower patients and families to start considering these issues at a primary palliative care level but realize also that there's a role for tertiary level conversations, those really intense conversations that lead to in the moment medical decision making. And that may require additional training for healthcare providers who are in a variety of disciplines and specialties, mm -hmm. and also at times is going to require specialty palliative care. And to acknowledge that we really need all of that in order to get advanced care planning and shared decision making done. And currently we don't have the workforce to accomplish that at the primary level or the tertiary level. Any comments from the panel? David, do you want to say that? Only to echo that I agree with you, uh, I, I really do. And I really want to um, just mention one uh, particular point. You mentioned the faith community. Uh, one of the experiences uh, we've had with CTAC, uh, one of our uh, major initiatives is a faith-based initiative uh, led by the Reverend Tyrone Pitts uh, from the D.C. area and uh, Rabbi Richard Address uh, from the uh, Philadelphia uh, and surrounding New Jersey area. And it's been a particularly impressive part of our efforts. Uh, right now, there's a major initiative in Alameda, Cal uh, in the uh, Oakland, Alameda area uh, that's led by uh, the Reverend Pitts. And I, I think it ties with what you said, Stephanie. It was one of the great ways uh, to build trust and be viewed in a trustworthy way uh, that community has been remarkably uh, active and supportive of these kinds of initiatives. And I think it's something we need to all keep in mind. It's one of the ways to, to, uh, to tackle uh, public engagement in a very effective way. 
talk about Pine or for clinical ethics and palliative medicine at Baylor Healthcare System and one of the authors of the Texas Advanced Directives Act. And just want to correct one thing about Munoz's case. It was not the law that prevented mechanical ventilation from being withdrawn from a brain dead patient in Fort Worth. Um, it was a hospital that, for reasons no other hospital council I know, uh, somehow misread the law, but I just I want to be very clear about that. And even if the patient had not been brain dead and had uh, been terminally ill or irreversibly ill as defined in the Texas Advanced Directives Act, the law still does not actually prohibit the withdrawal of treatment during pregnancy. I, I don't want to give a lecture on the act, but a lot of things have been said wrong in the media about that, that whole case, and I, I, don't think we, I don't think we've heard the end of it. Um, on the uh, more important issue of the day, the advanced care planning, I really want to echo what Dr. Hansen said. I, I too come from a background in, in geriatrics and practice palliative medicine, and there is an incredible workforce shortage. Um, advanced care planning is something that's got to occur over the lifespan of the patient starting as a preventive illness intervention in the 18 or 20 year old or 30 year old person who comes to the primary care office. It also has to be a process that occurs when the patient gets a more serious diagnosis <coughs> and goes to the oncologist's office. It also has to be a process that occurs when the patient is old enough to come to my office in a geriatric practice <coughs> or sick enough to come to my office in the last one to two years of life, which would be the typical lifespan that I think an outpatient palliative medicine practice might see. And I think we've got to start thinking outside the box. I've, I've helped write the living will in the state of Texas. I'm very proud of it. I think it's a really good document for a paper document. We offer more choices than most states do. We offer a document that says you can use this to choose aggressive treatment, or you can use this to choose more limited treatment. But I will tell you, any paper document's going to be seriously flawed. We've got to shift advanced care planning out of this always one-on-one -on -one conversation between the, the busy clinician, the busy nurse practitioner, the busy social worker, the busy uh, chaplain. And I think the way to do that is to start to do it the way we do everything else, it seems, in modern life, <coughs> using um, digital care planning tools, tools that allow that document to track the patient, to go in and be changed. You don't have to pick up the paper form and exit out and write a new one. So I <coughs> just want to make that, that plea for that, that people start thinking outside the box in terms of, of how we do advanced care planning. Our chaplains are starting to do this now. Our social workers are starting to do it. And in our healthcare system, at least for the physicians who are uh, direct partners with the healthcare system, we've worked uh, digital tools. We're starting to work them directly into our electronic medical records. And I think that's the direction we need to move with advanced care planning. Thank you. Um, I just just a thank you. Thank you for that clarification. That was helpful. But um, the other key thing that you're talking about as we move to this digital age and electronic registries, electronic health records, you know, I don't think I will still be alive when we finally have electronic health records. But that being said, as Joanne was saying, um, if we look to the future and what the electronic health records will bring, should they be here, um, they don't even have a space in there for care planning. So assuming we get futuristic and we start thinking about embedding advanced care planning in care planning, Meaningful Use 3 doesn't anticipate clear planning. Meaningful Use 3 might have a checkbox for advanced directives, but even that is only a checkbox. It doesn't even allow for like a PDF version of your advanced directive. So if the government wants to do something, please knock on the door of ONC and say, you know, Meaningful Use 3 is going to be here at some point, and in 2017, when it's here, we really do need these forward-thinking things included. 
I'm Mike McGee with uh, CAST. Um, I don't want to step on uh, my message this afternoon, but I thought uh, because uh, the issue of broadness of the, of the vision, uh, as well as thinking outside of the box has been brought up, I'd uh, at least queue up um, something that um, I'm hearing uh, in this first uh, portion of, of the meeting and, and uh, see if the panel might uh, comment on that. And it's this, that um, back uh, when uh, we had the Commission on Long-Term Quality Care that Bob Kerry and Newt Gingrich uh, chaired, uh, one of the issues that came up was the fact that uh, in terms of long-term care and palliative care uh, and end-of-life planning, uh, there was a bias um, toward brick and mortar, uh, toward specialists, toward providers, um, which creeped in and was really represented in 95% of the remarks, even though uh, all of us attempted to demonstrate that we were trying to represent more multi-generational families, more of the home, more of uh, decision-making outside of uh, the medical complex. And yet, if you looked at the word volume, and if you looked at the issues raised, uh, what we found is that it was very hard to break out of um, that power base that had been established over many years and really formed what defined an expert in this field. They were provider-centric. They were brick-and-mortar focused. The issues that they thought were the critical issues was what happened in the critical care or what happened in the uh, hospital wards. And yet, within the context of more broadly what's happening in healthcare now, uh, it's moving toward efficiency, it's moving toward mobility, it's moving toward connectivity, it's recognizing that we've gone from a three generational family to a four and five generational family with much more complexity. And it's moving toward trying to do a preventive care system at the same time that we're managing chronic disease burden. So, uh, I want to, in a more focused way, ask the question, do you feel that we are prepared to put a home with a multi-generational family connected to a mobile care team, a different type of care team, at the center of long-term care planning, or do you believe that we need to continue to have a sub-segment of the provider community that is primarily connected to institutions that are brick and mortar focused making these decisions? Well, I just wanted to make one comment and I agree with you that we need to answer some of those, but I want to, I want to first say we n must address a fundamental demographic factor. People like me, you know, widows, we're going to make up an increasing portion of the population. All of the things we're talking about are based on family. Not everybody has a family. You were going to have to really broaden our vision, and so I, I throw that out. You want me to stand? For the camera? Okay. Um, I don't know that I'm responding to your question, Dr. McGee, but I think. Um, trying to link that to the earlier comments about, um, about workforce issues, I guess I think we have to expand what we think of as the workforce around this issue. And I think we have to find many more touch points where we can deal with advanced care planning, both to raise awareness of it, to execute its various forms, and then to ensure that you know, people's wishes are followed. Um, I've done a lot of work with CDC related to clinical preventive services, and one of the real challenges is the realization that for the older adult population, the uptake of critical life-saving clinical preventive services like immunizations, uh, breast cancer screening, colorectal cancer screening, we've relied, we've relied heavily on the clinical setting to be the place where people take care of that uh, and learn about it. Well, it's failing. It's not working. 
And so we have to move those services into the community setting. And that's being done, fortunately, this link from community uh, and linking community and clinical to move out in the community both to educate and to deliver is really important. And I think that's really true here. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to see that uh, the ACL and CDC and others have really embraced, for example, the chronic disease self-management program. That program has in it at least uh, acknowledges ex um, advanced care planning or ex uh, advanced directives. And so there's some studies have shown real rates of increases among people who participate in the chronic disease self-management program and at least executing advanced directives. Um, in the work that CDC did around trying to define end-of-life care as a public health matter, they really looked at across the board in the various programs at CDC to see, well, who really addresses end-of-life care? And it was very limited. The one place where they found some work was in the cancer um, uh, programs. You know, there, there are grants given to states to create cancer control programs. And they at least had within their grants, their plans, state plans, they talked about end-of-life care as an important issue. If you go on the CDC's website, um, the, uh, I think it's the website for HIV AIDS in South Africa talks about end-of-life care. But you don't find it many other places. And I think just within public health, there are multiple touch points where we need folks to begin thinking about end-of-life care, advanced care planning, all the issues that we're talking about. Um, that's part of the workforce, and the same is true in the aging services and other places. Okay, I want to thank the panel for the uh, first session this morning. It's been, I think, kicked us off in a good way for a very robust discussion the rest of the day.